It is my pleasure to uh, present to you today uh, our ashram uh, rare earth element project and fluorospar deposit in Quebec, Canada. As Simon said at the beginning though, uh, we have been working on rare earth elements for quite a long time, which would be just over 15 years. And it was 15 years ago that the Chinese imposed unilaterally the export trade uh, 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 duty on rare earth elements. And that created essentially for the first time in three years or four years, the opportunity for a Western company to be an alternate source of rare earth elements. One of the things that we educated ourselves on very early on in the summer of 2005 was what was the dominant style of rare earth element deposit in commercial operations operation at that time. The interesting uh, synergy is, is that our, our tantalum deposit in British Columbia, uh, which is also the largest defined resource of tantalum uh, that I know of on plant, planet Earth with about 24 million pounds of tantalum in that resource, it is carbonatite hosted. And that is one of the words that I hope you do remember from this presentation. At any rate, our introduction into rare earth elements started in 2005, and we found the ashram rare earth element and fluorospar deposit in 2009. It's a pleasure to share this presentation with you. In terms of rare earth elements, let me just say that everyone needs rare earth elements. Whether you're red or you're blue, it is the green wave that is washing over you. Whether you're Greta Thunberg or Vin Diesel, whether you're driving an electric assist bicycle or a, a Dodge Charger, you need rare earth elements. In terms of the world's largest uh, oil producer, Saudi Aramco, I would have hoped that more people would have woken up, smelled the coffee, seen the writing on the wall in November of 2019 when Saudi Aramco uh, IPO'd with over a, a trillion dollar valuation. And the management of Saudi Aramco at that time said publicly that they believed peak oil was 2035. When I would argue that around the boardroom table in Riyadh, they were probably saying 2020 24, maybe 2025. But at any rate, in their announcement of their IPO, they did say that they needed to diversify. They believed they needed to diversify. So that's why they went public. To be very clear, the majority of value for the rare earth elements is in the magnets, but currently the largest markets for rare earth elements are in service to the internal combustion engine, which would be cerium is used to manufacture catalytic converters and lanthanum is used to process oil into gasoline. In terms of rare earth element supply and demand, and I very much appreciated Simon's comments on a shift in demand, and this comes from a, an alternate rare earth element uh, uh, report, uh, Adamus Intelligence, quote, not only do rare earths used in magnets make up the lion's share of global value today, but in the years ahead, demand for these four rare earth elements is expected to grow faster than demand for all other rare earth elements, challenging the ability of the supply side to keep up. Going forward, we project that demand will substantially exceed global production, leading to the depletion of historically accumulated inventories and shortages of these critical rare earths if significant additional sources of supply are not developed. In terms of China, I would suggest that uh, the bogeyman factor of having one country uh, dominate any commodity, uh, which would be a problem, this may be slightly uh, nuance to be maybe somewhat less today, but I thought Tyler's uh, focus on this was excellent. Um, but essentially, whether or not you believe China, they reported that they became a net importer in the fall of 2018. China currently buys from Myanmar, Vietnam, Australia, North Korea, and the United States Mountain Pass materials, and they have made significant investments globally. Uh, in terms of COVID-19 and this Annus horribilis, uh, there have been two factors that have affected the rare earth element market. One would be a significant increase in anxiety about uh, industry uh, manufacturers continuing to be dependent uh, or having their business plan dependent upon sources coming in from China for really anything. The second thing is, is that uh, there have been uh, uh, um, um, wonderful innovations, I would say, and I mean wonderful, if you've bought, if you've haven't, happened to have bought a new Dyson uh, air cleaner or vacuum cleaner or a new leaf blower as I have during uh, this uh, period of COVID-19 under what some analysts have called 
the stay at home index, which is a significant increase of purchases of home electronics that require rare earth element permanent magnet motors. The leaf blower I bought, bought recently, literally you have to hold on to it because it, it will almost levitate by itself. Amazing products. In terms of rare earth element misinformation, uh, I would like to make it very clear that uh, rare earth element extraction and processing, is that actually harmful to the environment? No, it is not intrinsically harmful, more harmful to the environment than any other commodity and less than, you know, the, the somewhat atypical, but uh, certainly problematic cyanide leaching of gold projects. Um, the Chinese production was historically harmful to the environment, but Western regulations do not allow for this kind of extraction. And China has even shut down many uh, projects and have applied costs uh, to reduce environmental impacts. And as Manny pointed out, there is capital being expended to, uh, uh, for downstream processing of waste material. Secondly, is it accurate to say that rare earth elements are not found globally in economic concentrations? This is not accurate. It is the host mineralogy that is the difference between being economic and being a complete waste of money. This brings us to the square peg round hole aspect. Monocyte, bastinocyte, and xenotime dominate the industry. There has been, uh, by other estimates, industry estimates, over a billion dollars U.S. spent on projects with problematic mineralogy. The Ashram project is the most advanced rare earth element project in North America to compare favorably to the dominant Chinese producers. This screen is especially for Clint Cox, who loves a Shazam screen. And this is mainly to introduce what I hope you will remember from this presentation if you remember nothing else. And that is these fundamentals of mineralogy and geology. Number one, over 150 rare earth minerals exist, but only four have ever been commercialized. Monocyte, bastinocyte, and xenotime account for over 80% of all rare earth element production. Mani is right. Rare earth elements are abundant in the earth's crust, but they're mostly in the 150 rare earth element minerals, which cannot be processed successfully at this point in time. Number two, only monocyte, bastinocyte, and xenotime are amenable to producing high grade mineral concentrates of better than 40%. And number three, the host rock type for over 80% of all global rare earth element production is the carbonatite. And the ashram deposit has all of these traits along with a demonstrated ability to produce high grade, better than 45% trio mineral concentrates at high recoveries. This is a list of current producers of rare earth elements and you will see the list of all of the carbonatites here. And then you get down to the granitoid and the placers and the clays and you only see one hosted by the oddball mineral loperite and that is in Russia. In terms of linus, linus are a subset uh, of a carbonatite, which is called a laterite, which is a weathered carbonatite, and that uh, created an issue for them that was essentially solved by the Japanese uh, giving them $260 million back in 2011. This brings us to the ashram, arguably the best rare earth element deposit that is not yet in production. The Ashram Project is located in the northern third of Quebec in an area called Nunavik, and Nunavik is under the treaty, which is called the James Bay Northern Quebec uh, Agreement. And this is the most codified, streamlined agreement for the development of a mining project in North America. So this is the best region of the best province, arguably in terms of mining jurisdictions in Canada and in North America. Yes, Commerce Resources owns 100% of the project. And in terms of government interest, uh, the government of Quebec was for a couple of years, our largest shareholder after they invested a million dollars into us. In terms, of the, in terms of the resource for the Ashram Rare Earth Element Project right now, we have a measured category of 1.6 million tons, an indicated category of 27.7 million tons, and an inferred category of 219.8 million tons at an average of about 1.8% rare earth elements. Now, since that time, since this re resource was released in 2012, we, had, we have added 9,700 meters to this resource. And in all of that drilling, we have uh, encountered three things. One, 
material where we didn't expect to find it, which was because we were looking to uh, do condemnation drilling to find the outer limits of the deposit uh, where we want to uh, locate a dike. Uh, but we kept on finding more mineralization. Number two, we hit higher grade material. And number three, we hit less waste rock at surface than was modeled in this resource, which was in our preliminary economic assessment in 2012. So I do look forward to the release of the next resource, which will be in our pre-feasibility study. In terms of what ultimately makes a rare earth element project economic, it is the ability to reduce your mass. And ultimately, with our on-site operations, we're able to reduce our mass by 75%. And so on an extraction rate of 4,000 tons per day, we're, at, we're able to separate down to only 1,000 tons per day, which is then the material we will ship out. As you can see here, our ability to produce a 45 to 50 percent mineral concentrate compares with all of the producers right now and is slightly better than Linus. In terms of the magnet feed material, and if you recall the slide on what is the greatest value in the rare earth elements, it is the magnet feed. It is the four, praseodymium, neodymium, terbium, and dysprosium. And we, the ASHRAM project, has 24.7% of the uh, distribution of the deposit in these four magnet feeds, which is a percentage better than Linus and 8% better than mountain pass materials uh, with their mountain pass deposit. In terms of the ashram deposit flow sheet, this is about as standard as it gets in the rare earth element sector in terms of uh, 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 crushing, grinding, flotation, the beneficiation, and then in the following hydrometallurgical process. But I would like to draw your attention to this part of the slide where in the magnetic separation, we create two concentrates. One is the 45 to 50% rare earth element concentrate, and the second non-magnetic concentrate is the fluorospar concentrate. In terms of the fluorospar, uh, we uh, reached out to Glencore in 2015 for a location for our downstream uh, uh, hydrometallurgical facility, and they became very excited about our fluorospar byproduct. If you recall our resource of approximately 249 million tons in total, uh, that resource includes about 7 to 8 percent of fluorospar. So an approximately uh, a resource of approximately 20 million tons of fluorospar, which puts us as we believe the second largest fluorospar deposit on planet Earth. At any rate, in 2016, we are encouraged to sign a binding MOU with Northalco Sales and Glencore. We are very happy to do that. And in the intervening three years or four years since that time, the fluorospar market has gone absolutely crazy, with China also becoming a net importer of fluorospar and the prices doubling, tripling, depending upon which specific fluorospar commodity you're talking about. Now, I'm very excited uh, that we have just produced additional samples of our fluorospar byproduct, and you can see this lovely kind of purple slop, which is uh, acid grade, technical acid grade fluorospar, and this is our byproduct, which was not included in our preliminary economic assessment, and this will be forwarded to industry uh, for as per their requests. In terms of rare earth element concentrate requests, you can see a uh, sampling of some of the companies that have requested material from us. And you can also see the location of the deposit and the proximity to Western Europe. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of Western European companies that made a request of our rare earth element concentrate, started by the world's largest rare earth element uh, processor that is not a Chinese company, which is Solvay. And uh, they made their request on the day I became president of Commerce Resources, which was September 15th, 2014, as we were touring the world's oldest solvent extraction facility, which is Solvay Rhodius facility on the west coast of France at La Rochelle. Something we're very excited about is the announcement last month from Energy Fuels in terms of their successful transitioning to become a rare earth element processor. And uh, synchronistically around the same time, we realized that we had nine kilograms of leach residue from uh, at our pilot plant at Hazen Research in Colorado. And we will be upgrading this leach residue uh, into a sample to be delivered to Energy Fuels.
In terms of government initiatives right now, this is a partial list of some of the government initiatives towards getting uh, security of supply and actually hopefully achieving a full scale rare earth element supply chain outside of China. 100 million euros put forward just very recently by the European Raw Materials Alliance, IRMA. $90 million from Quebec for their critical and strategic minerals plan. 250, mineral, 250 million dollars, which was uh, stroked by the current inhabitant of the White House on October 3rd uh, for the Defense Production Act, which is important because the language of that uh, Defense Production Act does mean that Canadian projects are eligible for this capital. And then in terms of some of the companies that have received capital already, we have less common metals in the UK that received 17 million euros from the uh, Horizon 2020 fund in 2018, and urban mining, which just received $29 million from the US Department of Defense to build up their magnet making facility in Texas. I would like to draw your attention to a newsletter and uh, a report that was written about commerce resources by Jordan Roy Byrne. I believe it is an excellent report, but I haven't actually read it. But uh, he is new to the rare earth element uh, sector, and uh, I believe he does understand the fundamentals extremely well. One of the things that Jordan has been following is the Van Eck Rare Earth Elements uh, Strategic Metals Fund. And as you can see, they have just recently broken out. Uh, below this, you can see the chart for commerce resources, which is yet to break out. This slide, show me the money. At the end of the day, it's all about the economics. You know, whether your project is economic or not, is based on the fundamentals I've already uh, spoken about, whether or not you have the standard mineralogy or the standard geology, and in the case of the ashram, we have both. In terms of the prices that, we that were used by us in our 2012 preliminary economic assessment, you can see them here. And recently the prices have started spiking again. And these are the prices from the December 3rd buy info report uh, of which we subscribe to from Beijing. So the most significant price increase is arguably for neodymium. And as was said in previous presentations, neodymium is arguably the most important for magnet manufacturing. Uh, in terms of percentage. And then you can also see the increase in the value of terbium, which is basically being the substitute for dysprosium. I would argue that your average permanent magnet in 2010 was 13% dysprosium, and the average permanent magnet today is only 1% dysprosium. And so that balance, that 12% balance has been picked up by NEO, but mostly by terbium, and that's why its price is so high right now. At any rate, our preliminary economic assessment uh, in 2012 gave the ASHRAM project a $2.3 billion NPV and a 44% internal rate of return. Those economics are no longer uh, uh, viable, but they didn't include the benefit of our fluorospar byproduct. And as you can see, they were based on prices which are, uh, uh, are on prices which are generally lower than the current prices. So we do look forward to releasing our pre-feasibility study. To sum up, the Ashram Rare Earth Element Project is the most standard type of deposit globally. It's a monazite dominant carbonatite. We have a huge resource. We're located in a great jurisdiction. We have produced high grade rare earth element concentrates. We released positive, positive economics in 2012. And we now have the addition of the Fluorospar byproduct, and we also have the financing underway. At any rate, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today, and it's a pleasure to be included with all of these other knowledgeable speakers, uh, Tyler, Simon, Clint Cox, and uh, Mr. Gareth Hatch coming up later. Thank you very much.